Hello everybody. Um, uh, so uh, the purpose of this course is to, uh, uh, well this lecture I should say, is to start introducing the content of theme 3 uh, for the course and that has to do with the environmental transmission of bacterial, viral, and fungal pathogens. I've added viral to the list of things I'm going to look at uh, because I, I want to consider all types of pathogens. Um, so uh, in this first course, what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about the general context. So for those of you who are proper epidemiologists, uh, this is probably something that you know, and uh, if I say anything silly, actually, please let me know. Uh, for the others, uh, this is a sort of brief crash course on that type of topic. Um, so um, I'm going to use throughout, and you see that I've uh, sort of edited the way I'm doing videos, which uh, uh, should uh, allow me uh, to uh, display things. Um, so throughout I'm probably going to write ETP for environmentally transmitted pathogens and this is to cover all three uh, types that I'm going to talk about. And again this is theme three of the course. So uh, first before I start uh, let me point out that uh, what is uh, my, my resources for preparing this uh, lecture, uh, I've used uh, abundantly a chapter on environmentally transmitted pathogens, uh, that's in a book uh, on environmental microbiology uh, by Gerba and others, but that particular ch uh, chapter is by Gerba. Um, when applicable, I have followed essentially the same order as he did. Uh, although there are things that I added, I have things that I removed, etc. I've also uh, made abundant use of uh, resources on the CDC website, and you will see uh, that all the titles in my slides are clickable, uh, and those links take you to the CDC website most of the time. There are a few exceptions. Uh, I've used Wikipedia and some resources uh, available from Wikipedia, Google Scholar for some papers. Uh, one remark, as I've also have, I have a lot of figures in this, uh, in this presentation. Um, they come from Wikipedia, from Google Image Search, from papers, etc. And one thing that I want to point out is that you will see that I have sometimes weird colors um, in my diagrams in particular. That is because I wanted to uh, make things fit within this black uh, theme that I'm using for the slides. Uh, and so I've, in, I've used a a little tool that allows to invert the colors uh, seamlessly. Uh, so if you want uh, to look at the proper uh, diagrams, not with weird colors, you might want to look at the source for the slides, uh, which is in one of the subdirectories uh, in the GitHub repo. And uh, from these sources, you'll have the links to uh, the proper uh, diagrams. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about in this course is uh, what's listed here. Uh, so first of all, I want to spend a few minutes talking about common features in environmentally transmitted pathogens. And then I'll go through a sort of bestiary of uh, some of those environmentally transmitted pathogens. So I'll talk about bacteria, parasites, viruses, and fungi. And then I'll have a very brief summary uh, to, uh, to summarize this. Um, actually, I realize that I don't have parasites listed in my, uh, in my list of topics. I should have added parasites. I will edit the slides uh, so that they appear also in my title. Um, so, but first of all, let's uh, look a little bit at 
what we could call common features uh, in environmentally transmitted parasit, uh, pathogens. So, first of all, one thing that I want to stress is that we are here talking about a, and so I have something which makes me smaller when needed, uh, about uh, a wide variety of pathogens and an enormously wide variety of diseases, okay? Um, but the overall idea is that in this course, what we'll be considering is pathogens that replicate or are able to survive in an abiotic environment. That means they are able to survive outside of life. Um, so they can be, uh, they can survive in the environment and therefore be acquired from the en environment. And a lot of those diseases that we are going to consider are what are called enteric diseases. Uh, so diseases that have to do with the uh, the digestive system, there's a lot of foodborne diseases. And I should make one thing clear uh, before I begin, is that if you think about surviving in the environment, most diseases have a phase during which they can survive uh, in most pathogens, have a, a phase uh, that they can survive outside of the body for. Uh, but it's necessary in a way to limit what we're looking at because otherwise we'd be looking at all diseases. So here I'm really going to think about the environment as a contributing uh, factor. And just a link that I've added here. Uh, so for example, the CDC has a division of foodborne, waterborne, envir environmental diseases. And everything that you find here is the type of diseases that we are going to consider in this course. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do is here. Um, so what's, I talked about enteric diseases, so maybe let me make myself small again. Um, an enteric disease is a group of diseases that's uh, associated with ingesting food or water that's contaminated uh, and that attack the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, and actually, as a, as a fun little exercise, uh, you've probably heard these past few weeks talk about something called ChatGPT, which is an AI. And I asked uh, ChatGPT to define an enteric disease, and that's the definition that I got, which is, I think, very appropriate. Uh, so it's an illness that affects the digestive system, especially, specifically the intestines and they can be caused by a variety of factors, including viral, bacterial, parasitic infections. Uh, so you can see that it's quite funny because I did not tell the AI that I wanted this, and this is what I got, uh, which is interesting. Um, but anyway, you see that this is going to be a large part of this course, not, not the only part, okay, but uh, quite a few of the diseases we will see in the course are uh, enteric diseases. Oh, and I'm again selecting the wrong one. So uh, one remark, uh, I don't remember when that was, but uh, years ago, I saw a presentation by someone um, who was talking about this uh, type of problem and they uh, named it the celebrated fecal oral route. So this is a bit of a, I mean, joke, it's not a joke, it's uh, something that kills a lot of people, that celebrated root. But it is, you'll see in uh, this presentation that there are a lot of those diseases that go through the environment that are actually using this root. And so here, what you have is a diagram, I think it's in, um, uh, what was it, Philippines perhaps? Uh, that's uh, UNICEF uh, generated and that's trying to explain uh, to kids uh, what that fecal oral root is and uh, essentially uh, this is something we'll see throughout the, the lecture and as a because it will come that often I will denote it F dash O R for fecal oral root um, and as I said, this is going to be very 
prevalent in the diseases that I'm going to talk about here. Now, this is another view of the same problem. Uh, so human feces, uh, it's actually not the only mechanism, but for in, in the case of that one, human feces can go through a variety of uh, mediums. Uh, so it can contaminate fluids, so water sources, the fields, uh, the soil. It can be carried by flies. It can be carried by improper hand washing. It can go on fomites. So these are things that we'll see again in a second. And those contaminations either go directly to the new host or they uh, go through the food into the new host. Okay. And that is one very common mechanism of uh, transmission. This is a slightly more evolved uh, look at uh, the, the problem, which now incorporates uh, livestock and domestic animals and animals present in the environment. So this is more like, you know, this is a One Health course, and this is part of the One Health uh, paradigm uh, to see that this contamination, again, can take the same shape but it can also come uh, from, uh, oh, this is not allowing me to go far enough, uh, it can go uh, into, uh, fr from livestock or uh, various animals that live in the environment of an individual and make its way again to a future victim. Okay. Uh, Fomites is a word I, I used uh, recently, and let me just define it. So what uh, we call a fomite is an inanimate object that can transfer a pathogen uh, to a new host uh, when that object itself is contaminated or exposed to what pathogen we're thinking of. And so this is going to be a very, very important topic when we consider hospital settings. Uh, hospital acquired infections, so nosocomial infections, uh, will be something that we look at within this course and uh, they are typically, uh, they can be carried uh, by fomites if, if the uh, proper uh, care of the settings is not done. And there's a very well known example uh, of uh, SARS-CoV-1, so the 2003 SARS epidemic, uh, where the infected, oh, so I have to switch again to a bigger version, so the infected patient, the person who started the worldwide spread was staying in this room in what's called the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong, and people that were confirmed or probable secondary patients were in these nearby rooms, okay, on the same floor. I think it was the ninth floor, if I remember well. Um, and these are locations where uh, they found uh, environmental samples of SARS-CoV-1. So I'm actually not going to speak so much about SARS-CoV-1 in this course, but this is something we could consider because there was transmission through the environment, not only person to person, but person indirectly to fomite into uh, another person. Again, pressing the wrong button. Uh, one important characteristic also of these diseases, uh, of those pathogens, is that they are, because the environment uh, plays a role, well, the um, change in the environment uh, also plays a role. So here, this is uh, an example. So it's, uh, if you click, you can go to, uh, to the, the page. Oops, sorry, that's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to get there, but uh, there's an example of a paper here about uh, environmental transmission of fungi. And they highlight the role of climate change in terms of changing the attributes of uh, the various fungi that they're considering and uh, the consequences of these changes on uh, the, their, their propagation. 
another common theme and I'll probably record a video uh, shorter video than this one but specific to this because this is a theme that's very very important uh, to uh, Omni uh, Reuni and uh, to many people here and this is something we are going to look at with the models and so it, it is worth looking at uh, and that's antimicrobial resistance. So this again is me asking that uh, AI, how it defines AMR. And so this is the definition that I got. Uh, so antimicrobial resistance occurs when microorganisms such as, look at this, this is exactly the list we have in this course, uh, bacteria, fungi, viruses, and parasites develop the, the ability to survive exposure to antimicrobial drugs. Uh, and that has enormous consequences uh, because, for instance, it will make treatments not as efficacious or it will uh, so, sort of prophylax uh, prophylactic treatment uh, will also become less uh, advantageous. Uh, there will be issues, for instance, with uh, pathogens that are spread in hospitals or pathogens that are spread to livestock, etc. So th this is an important topic and as I said, I'll, I think uh, I ambition to record just a tiny other, well not tiny, but another, another video specifically on that topic with a bit of numbers in there. Um, now uh, let me take you through a, a short tour of a variety of pathogens that are environmentally transmitted. And uh, just as a warning, uh, actually there's not that many that are not pretty, uh, but there's one or two pictures in there that you might find a little, mm -hmm. but this is, this is the pathogens we're looking at. Uh, and this is what they cause, so you have to sort of face that thing. Uh, so the first uh, class of pathogens that I'm going to look at are the bacteria that are transmitted by the environment. And you have a list here of the ones I'm going to detail. Um, a lot of them, you know, are associated with food security, for example, but some of us are uh, associated to other problems. Oh. So uh, one thing that will come up in the description that I'll very briefly detail, and again, I'll confess uh, mostly uh, being ignorant about this, uh, but uh, this comes up quite a lot of, of times in a description of a bacterium, uh, and it's what's called gram-negative or gram-positive. And the idea is simply whether the bacterium in question is reactive to what's called the gram staining method. Um, and so here, for example, I, you have an example that I, I picked uh, where uh, you have gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Uh, the ones that appear the, this light red are gram negative and those retain the violet stain used in staining. Uh, and so those are a gram positive, gram negative. Okay, and this will come up. They, those different types of bacteria have different uh, characteristics. Most of the ones we're going to see here are gram negative. Okay. So the first uh, bacterium I want to talk about is um, Salmonella, which you've all heard about. Um, so Salmonella is a gram negative bacterium. Uh, it's a genus, so it's a, 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 a group of uh, bacteria, okay, it's not a single species. Um, and they uh, affect uh, people mostly due to ingestion of food that, are contami uh, that is contaminated by animal or human species, uh, feces, sorry. So, fecal oral transmission route, essentially. Uh, but that will happen uh, in, in, in the industrialized world, let's say, in the, in the rich world, mostly through uh, bad practices at food vendors and etc. This is not what I wanted to do. 
Uh, one type of uh, Salmonella infection that is sort of has a different name is uh, typhoid fever. So that one is uh, caused by a, a specific uh, species of uh, Salmonella, which is uh, Salmonella typhi or typhi. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, and those uh, have symptoms that vary from mild to severe. Uh, the uh, symptoms usually begin six to 30 days after exposure. I had uh, one of the references I gave, but it was taking me too long, but I recommend if you, if you go back, no, that is not where I wanted to go back. If you go back to the the Gerba chapter here, uh, you will see he has a few tables that give a very nice presentation of the different incubation times, well, uh, time be before the onset of symptoms and so on. Um, so I recommend taking a look at this. I, I didn't incorporate them in the lecture, but very easily accessible. So uh, typhoid fever, again, uh, spread by eating or drinking food or water contaminated with the feces of an infected person, which is the celebrated fecal oral route. Um, e. coli is another gram-negative bacterium. Uh, it's found very commonly in the uh, warm-blooded organisms, but some uh, serotypes of some types uh, cause serious food poisoning. So most E. coli uh, or most Escherichia uh, bacteria don't cause problems. There's only just a few that do, but those that do cause big problems and therefore are fought against also quite uh, regularly. And those, uh, as is the case with Salmonella, in the, in the West, in, the, uh, in rich countries, most contaminations happen because of bad handling of food. And we will see some examples of modeling in that case. Uh, you get a variety of uh, problems that arise from uh, E. coli. Um, Campylobacter is another gram-negative bacterium. Uh, it causes a uh, diarrheal disease in humans. Typically, it's self-limiting. That means you don't, it stops by itself. Okay? You don't need treatment to, uh, to uh, stop the infection. Again, uh, it's mostly transmitted in that case from poultry, uh, but it's also present in water. Whoops. And you see, by the way, uh, when you click, uh, this takes you to, uh, well, in that case, the uh, Campylobacter uh, page on the CV CDC. So all those titles are clickable. That wasn't what I wanted to do, but never mind. Um, Vibrio. So these are very important ones. Uh, they're again gram negative. Uh, they come from the name vibro, uh, the Latin vibro, that means uh, shake, agitate, move quickly. Uh, they are involved in several types of foodborne infections, uh, of which uh, cholera is the most well known. Uh, vibriosis is another type of infection that's generated by vibrio. Uh, and they're also involved in wound infections and can be quite bad. Typically, these are bacteria that live in saltwater environments, and so they are associated with uh, consumption of contaminated water uh, in that environment or of organisms, and we'll see an example very uh, quickly. Um, so uh, the most well-known being Vibrio cholerae, which is the, the causative agent of cholera. Uh, it is transmitted through uh, ingestion of fecally contaminated food or water. So again, the fe uh, fecal or root. Uh, it remains present and in many parts of Central America, South America, Asia and Africa. Um, so it is very much an issue. Um, and I've 
linked a few uh, a few sites and in particular for example you can go to see the WHO cholera dashboard which gives you uh, the number of cases that were reported uh, last year etc and cholera is an example that I like a lot because I am most of my interest in epidemiology is in the uh, spatial temporal spread of infection, uh, infectious diseases. And here, this is the uh, essentially cholera is the source of the first real serious uh, spatial temporal uh, work uh, on uh, infectious diseases uh, by John Snow, who was a physician in the 1850s. And he uh, there was an epidemic uh, in London in 1854, and what he did was observe that uh, in that region, like here you can see there's a street called, uh, this is a little difficult to do, a street called Broad Street, uh, and there was a, a water pump here, and uh, here he's recorded all the deaths that happened because of cholera, and he remarked that uh, most deaths were taking place within some uh, short distance of uh, that pump that he uh, identified here. The pump was removed uh, and that led to uh, a sharp decrease in the number of cases and deaths. And so this is like a, a spatial analysis, uh, one of the first ones that you can find. Another type, and that's uh, sort of be careful. <laughs> uh, another type of uh, Vibrio infection is uh, infection with uh, Vibrio vulnificus, uh, and this is uh, something that can stem from the consumption of raw or undercooked uh, seafood, uh, mostly oysters. So remember that Vibrio live in salt water environments. So here we have. Uh, organisms like uh, oysters that are uh, contaminated with seafood and this is an example of uh, something that happened uh, after exposure to this bacterium and in that case I've, I've uh, linked to the uh, New England Journal uh, paper about this uh, that patient had to be amputated of his left arm because uh, he had necrosis of uh, the tissues. Uh, so this, this is a very severe uh, type of uh, infection. Another type of uh, bacterium is yet another uh, gram-negative bacterium, uh, Helicobacter pylori, uh, which goes through the fecal oral route. Uh, it's actually one of the major causes of peptic ulcer disease and gastritis. Okay. Legionella, uh, is uh, another gram-negative bacteria uh, and this uh, particular species, uh, Pneumophilia, uh, phila, sorry, is the causative agent of Legionellosis, uh, Legionellose in French, uh, and Pontiac fever. And this one is really well known, uh, Legionella, uh, because uh, it caused an outbreak in Philadelphia in uh, 1976. Uh, that was detected among a population of legionnaires, so former uh, vets in, in the US, um, who uh, were getting infected at higher rates. And they led to a, if you can read about this, it was a very interesting investigation and they found what the causative agent was and they found that it was being spread by cooling towers. So. It's something that people inhaled, uh, and because of the way the cooling towers used to be done, um, that was being spread in the street uh, outside of uh, the place where the, the convention was being held. Uh, so that has led to a lot of changes in the way cooling towers and the like are generally are sort of created. Uh, I think this is the last type of bacterium uh, that I look at, and actually this one is gram positive, it's the only one here. Uh, it has 21 species, 
and most human cases are uh, uh, generated by this one. Uh, the case fatality ratio uh, is near to 20%. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a very, uh, very bad case, uh, case fatality ratio. Uh, it's found mostly in soil, so that means it can contaminate vegetables and it can also be uh, carried by animals. Uh, so there's different, as actually I should point out, as many of those uh, diseases, there are several uh, pathways uh, to becoming infected. Okay? Now let's look at uh, environmentally transmitted parasites. So here I've got a little list of parasites uh, that are also transmitted by the environment. Uh, so let's, uh, let's uh, start our little uh, tour. Uh, Giarda, yeah, uh, is a uh, microorganism. Uh, it colonizes the small intestine. It causes diarrhea. It's found on surface, in soil, in food or water contaminated by the feces of infected people or animals. So uh, uh, fecal or root again. Uh, yes, that's it. So uh, that's one of those graphics that has a weird uh, color and because it's made to be on a black background. Uh, so I inverted the colors, but you can see that uh, there's a, uh, several stages to the infection. Uh, when you ingest uh, the dormant cysts, then there's a, they go through a, a series of uh, different stages and uh, then they are excreted through feces. They go into uh, the environment uh, and they can survive for long while in cold water and the, if someone else um, ingests them uh, then uh, they become contaminated in turn. Okay. Uh, Cryptosporidium parvum is a protozoan that infects a wide variety of uh, vertebrate hosts. Uh, the symptoms of infection are quite wide and for people that are immunocompetent typically there's not much consequences okay uh, there's self-limiting diarrheal Ill illness that typically resolves within two or three weeks i mean it is an unpleasantly long period to have an, uh, a diarrheal illness but it doesn't really require any outside intervention of course, outside intervention, medical attention will uh, potentially lower uh, either the duration of the infection or the symptoms, uh, but typically it goes okay. But for immunocompromised people, uh, there may be uh, complications that are much more complicated. So the cycle is again, so those parasites are um, magnificent in their uh, ways of uh, their, their life cycle is uh, fascinating and in terms of modeling they if you if you really want to make a good model of that type of uh, system it's really complicated okay so you see that there's a, a, a route uh, that um, is as usual uh, fecal route um, and the uh, the cycle of oops, the cycle of the uh, parasite itself is really really complicated. Okay, so this is a sort of simplification of the root itself, but the parasite uh, life cycle is really important. And I mean, depending on what your aim is as a modeler, uh, you might want to take this into account. Negliaria fowleri is, uh, I, I put the names here because they're quite scary and they, they are scary. Uh, their, another name is brain eating amoeba. Uh, I like this title, uh, shape shifting amoeba flagellate excavate. I have no clue what, I mean, I, I, I know what these words mean, but not 
taken together, but I, I found that the uh, combination was interesting. This is a, um, something that an amoeba that lives in soil and warm uh, fresh water. Uh, to give an example, this low prevalence of inf or low uh, incidence or prevalence, whatever, of, uh, in this case, it's essentially the same, uh, of infection in the US uh, each year, but with almost a 100% case fatality ratio. Okay, so if you're infected by this, uh, the outcome is not good. Uh, Toxoplasma gondi is a very well-known uh, parasite. Uh, it's again a protozoan parasite. It infects most species of warm-blooded animals and it causes toxoplasmosis. Um, so toxoplasmosis, the only definitive host, are uh, domestic cats and their relatives. And so the uh, cycle works something like this. So humans are accidental hosts, essentially. There's a, there's a cycle that involves the cats and some of their uh, prey species. But contamination can happen uh, through a variety of sources, whether it's uh, through animals or through a litter and a variety of problems like that. Uh, and in any case, uh, the humans are uh, typically infected. One of the main problems being that pregnant women can develop uh, issues and transmit them to uh, the fetus um, in the case of uh, toxoplasmosis. Okay. Uh, this uh, Beautiful picture is uh, not spaghetti or uh, noodles. It is uh, worms, nematodes. Uh, so these are very large nematodes. The adult females can do from 20 to 35 centimeters. The males are a bit smaller, 15 to 30. Uh, and they are parasites of the human intestine. Um, they, uh, the principal species involved in uh, humans is uh, that one, but there's also uh, a species coming from uh, pigs that can go uh, in humans. And again, fecal root, this is the uh, sort of simplified life cycle. Uh, the ingestion uh, comes uh, through a the oral route, uh, there's development in the, uh, in the human and the eggs um, are excreted uh, in the feces and they are uh, taken up uh, when the water sanitation system, for example, is not adequate. Tenia is uh, another type of, uh, so the tapeworm. Uh, is another type of uh, parasite that's transmitted by the environment. Um, I, I have here, if you're interested, this, uh, this is a this sort of joke. It's a, an English comic that unfortunately passed away last year, I believe, uh, who makes a joke saying that he has a tapeworm. So I just put this as a sort of way to uh, de-dramatize uh, this guy's uh, crazy face. A visa can be extremely long, okay? You, if you have one, they can be... Um, uh, they, most of the problems are digestive and also they can cause weight loss because if they become really big, they uh, eat quite a lot of your... Well, eat, they ingest quite a lot of your food. Uh, the system is, again, through the fecal oral route, uh, except this one typically there is uh, an intermediate host, so we have a definitive host, okay? The humans are uh, the definitive hosts, but the uh, contamination comes indirectly to humans from pigs or uh, cattle. Um, okay, the last one that I want to talk about, which is interesting because it's not in the Java book, uh, but I, I think it's a really, really important uh, environmentally transmitted parasite. Uh, so it's the schistosoma. Uh, so it's uh, trematodes. Uh, we had nematodes in the previous, this is trematodes. 
These are parasitic flatworms, so they look something like this. This is, uh, I don't remember exactly what size that is. Uh, I think it's 500 micrometers or something like this. They're parasitic flatworms and they're in, uh, responsible for schistosomiasis, which is a disease uh, that, like the precise burden is difficult to uh, estimate. I mean, the estimates vary widely, but it's estimated that probably about 240 million people uh, are in infected or affected uh, every year by this and that somewhere between 4,000 and 200,000 people die every year because of uh, schistosomiasis. Uh, so this is a neglected tropical disease, but that is uh, that should not be neglected. It's a major cause of death uh, in uh, Central Africa, for instance. And this is uh, what I would call a fecal oral root with a twist because the cycle in, involves humans, but also snails. So it's fecal oral in the sense that if you're infected with schistosomiasis, well, with a schistosome, uh, then uh, your urine and your feces contain them. And if they go to the water, uh, they will uh, be uh, in the water, okay, and they will contaminate snails. The life cycle goes through the snail, and then you have secariae that are released uh, from the snails into the water that are very small little um, uh, critters, uh, that, and those penetrate your, uh, your body uh, by drilling essentially into, I mean, they're not massive by any means, so they, it's not complicated for them to enter, but they penetrate the skin. And you can see, uh, I did not include any picture of that, but it, if, you, uh, uh, if you look around on the web, you will see pictures of people with entry uh, places uh, for the cercarie. This is a really important uh, topic. Uh, Years ago, the first time I went to Cameroon, uh, we had a, uh, the, the person who was in charge of the uh, schistosomiasis uh, program for Cameroon who came to give us a uh, presentation about this. And this is a, a major problem in some, some regions in Africa, including Cameroon. Um, it, I'll actually make another remark about this later, actually. But uh, this is... Interestingly, it's not in the Joba, but I think it's something that needs to be mentioned because it's a, it's a really important problem. Okay, let's switch on to viruses. Uh, I'm just going to go through these viruses here. Uh, I'll leave, uh, there's plenty of other viruses that go through the environment, but let's look at those. So the first uh, viruses that I'm going to look at, and so for viruses, this is really, if you remember when I started uh, this lecture, I pointed out that it's complicated to define, I mean, you have to sort of define precisely what you mean by environmentally transmitted. And with viruses, this problem is really a sort of probant. So I'll point it out when, when we progress. So adenoviruses, uh, they look a little bit like, uh, well, I mean, some of them are like the ones uh, that are pictured on the left here. Um, they're medium-sized, they're double-stranded DNA viruses. There's more than 50 types, uh, mostly causing respiratory illnesses. The reason I'm pointing them out uh, is that most transmission is human to human, uh, but they are resistant to many disinfectant, uh, and they can remain infectious for long periods on environmental surfaces, so on formites and medical instruments. Okay, so this is, in a sense, an environmentally transmitted uh, virus. Enteroviruses uh, are viruses that are enteric, uh, from a definition that we looked at before. These are positive sense, single-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, they can be found in feces, secretions, and blister fluid. So, of course, they are uh, they can, some of them take the fecal oral route, which sort of qualifies for an environmentally transmitted virus. 
and one very well-known fecal root virus, uh, that's an enterovirus, is poliovirus. Uh, so it's an enterovirus uh, with three ser serotypes. Uh, it's fecal oral and it's vaccine preventable. So I'll point that out from time to time because when we're looking at models uh, later, of course, some of the models will involve vaccination, others won't. Um, but it's it's worth uh, pointing out when something is vaccine preventable. Rhinoviruses, uh, I'm also mentioning them quickly because they are, uh, they can be transmitted through surfaces. Uh, they used to be a genus in their own, uh, but now they are enteroviruses, so that's where I, why I've included them here. The main interest in this course is that they can be transmitted through uh, the environment. So when we're looking at models for transmission with the environment, this is something we look at. Hepatitis A is found in the stool and blood of infected individuals, so of course uh, goes through the fecal route. Um, contaminated food or drinks, uh, it's also vaccine preventable. Hepatitis E is again fecal oral. Uh, typically in developing countries, people will get it through uh, the fecal oral route. In developed countries, uh, it comes from eating um, un raw or undercooked uh, some types of meats and uh, shellfish. Okay, so the situation depends a little bit on the sanitation, essentially. Rotaviruses or double-stranded RNA viruses. Uh, rotavirus A causes most of the human infection. Um, it's also a pathogen of livestock. Uh, it's, they've led uh, to uh, uh, an estimated 150,000 deaths uh, a year, like in 2019. They go through the fecal route and they also uh, go through fomites and most of them are vaccine preventable. And the last class of uh, pathogens transmitted through the environment that I want to go over is fungi. Uh, I'll point out that uh, this is here what I, I used. Uh, there's a variety of other sources, but I decided to just cite that one. Um, so the first type, uh, first genus is Aspergillus. Uh, it's got quite a few species in there. Uh, I'll just mention this. It's called Aspergillum because, uh, Aspergillus because it reminded the priest who first observed them uh, quite a while ago, okay, uh, who is also a biologist. Uh, of a holy water sprinkler. So <laughs> the names can come from a variety of places. Uh, this that you have on the left is Aspergillus niger. Uh, one that's very important is this one, Fumigatus, uh, that causes over 90% of uh, the infections that are observed with Aspergillus and they are particularly bad for people with uh, immunodeficiency. And here you have uh, quite a lot of things on this. But every time I'm pointing to these because you have uh, a variety of resources, including some data and some health professional, when, if, I mean, if you haven't navigated those pages yet, health professionals is where you find the proper scientific information typically. Um, so uh, that is one type of infection that is uh, generated by Aspergillus. This is what, uh, so the fumigatus that I was mentioning is invasive pulmonary, pulmonary aspergillosis. Well, this is terrible for me uh, as to pronounce. Uh, that uh, are, so the fungi enter your lung and here you have uh, an image. Uh, this is a, a CT scan of uh, someone whose lungs are uh, infected by this and uh, that arrow points to uh, a, a lesion uh, caused by the fungi. 
and uh, the case fatality ratio can be really, really high. Um, if you're diagnosed early enough, uh, then it's typically good. But uh, if the diagnosis is not done sufficiently quickly, uh, and also what you're, depending on your underlying conditions, the CFR can go almost to a 100% uh, death. Uh, I said I would do a, oops, I would do a, a lecture specific on antimicrobial resistance, but let me show you that, for example, this is one where uh, we know that uh, antifungal uh, resistance is arising because of the use uh, of azolus uh, fungicide. Okay, and so there's several routes through which uh, this antifungal anti uh, resistance uh, develops. And so, unfortunately, there are uh, strains that would be resistant uh, to uh, azolus, which could be used also to treat people, um, leading to issues. And as I said, I'll probably report just a brief extra lecture to, to go about AMR. Another type of uh, fungi uh, that's quite important, you see it's, a, it, it's environmentally transmitted, it's living everywhere in the environment, uh, and it typically doesn't cause much problem in immunocompetent people, but if you have immunocompromised or immunodeficient people, uh, that can cause cryptococcal meningitis. And it's estimated that there's about 150,000 cases a year, leading to over 100,000 uh, deaths per year. So it is uh, a large source of mortality. Uh, this is uh, the Cochigioides. <laughs> I'm really bad with those names. Uh, so th these are fungi living in the soil in, for example, the southwest US, uh, Mexico, Central and South America, but the range is expanding. So this is another, I was mentioning earlier that there, are, there were issues linked to the uh, climate change, for instance, and for instance, uh, these were detected now also in uh, Washington state. Uh, so the range has expanded north uh, and probably it will be in Canada at some point. I mean, it's still a desertic area of Washington state, so I'm not sure exactly when it would get to Canada, but this is a problem linked to um, range expansion because of uh, climate change. And as I said, so it causes uh, valley fever. This is a, a very interesting uh, phase, I mean, life cycle. Uh, so there's a, there's a phase that happens uh, within humans uh, that is represented here on the right. Uh, and there's a phase, a saprobic is that it's uh, eating dead material. So that's when it goes to the environment and uh, lives in the environment, survives in the environment for some time and might become ingested when, so they, they go to the soil, but then um, if the soil is disturbed, uh, humans or rodents or etc. might pick up um, the fungi and go on to develop infection. Okay, so in summary, uh, there's a wide variety of pathogens that are involved, uh, bacteria, parasites, viruses, and fungi, uh, and all of those have very uh, different ways of propagating. Uh, I point out that some of the infections are vaccine preventable, um, and uh, the problem of um, resistance to antimicrobials, so antimicrobial resistance uh, is widespread and should be considered. And we look at AMR, um, as I said, I might 
record a sort of specific uh, intro lecture about this. Um, but in any case, in the models, we look at it. And one thing that I really wanted to stress here, um, so I'll uh, tell a little anecdote because um, I, I find that it's enlightening. So I was uh, mentioning earlier that uh, the first time I went to Cameroon, I met with uh, the person who was at the time in charge of the uh, schistosomiasis program for, uh, for Cameroon. And uh, he presented uh, what the program did in Cameroon and he talked about the disease and etc. And after a while, after the end of his presentation, we were uh, talking about modeling. Uh, and at the end of his presentation, uh, after seeing some of us talk about modeling, he said, okay, so I, I, I agree. I mean, it's good to be doing modeling, but you have to realize that our main problem here is not so much to model the dynamics of a disease, is to obtain proper sanitation means, which doesn't really need modeling. Uh, so, of course, it's important to uh, understand the dynamics, etc. But altogether, a lot of those diseases that still kill a lot of people every year, or not only kill, but there's a lot of um, sort of uh, quality of life years lost uh, to these diseases, uh, those diseases could, to a large extent, be uh, curtailed uh, by uh, having access to proper sanitation systems. And that is uh, one very important thing. So when, when we're looking at models of uh, waterborne diseases uh, or etc., you have to remember that probably the biggest objective should, before anything else, be to equip uh, people with proper access to sanitation so that their fecal route is sort of interrupted.